Um, the, the Institute, as some of you may be aware, is also the, the seat of the historical archives of the European institutions. Uh, uh, but it is important to stress that uh, uh, this uh, mission also entails, uh, let's say, a, a kind of uh, intellectual responsibility. Uh, we're not simply uh, hosting uh, the archives of uh, the institutions, but also of a uh, number of important actors uh, in the uh, complex process of European integration. Uh, with that comes the responsibility of ensuring that this rich material is really uh, fully exploited and analyzed. And uh, the, the book uh, we are discussing today is just a, a first class illustration of what one can do with the rich material uh, that is uh, stored here. The uh, uh, work in question has been uh, coordinated uh, in the framework of a research center named after Alcide de Gasperi, who is, after all, it may be worth uh, recalling, a distinguished, uh, was a distinguished member of the EPB group, uh, or, or at least uh, the, the runner-up to uh, the EPB group uh, at the time he was uh, a member of the first uh, parliamentary assembly. And, and th th this work has been, uh, uh, like much of the work um, conducted in the framework of the Alcide de Gasperi Center, <clears throat> it has been uh, informed by uh, all sorts of cooperations uh, with a variety of institutional actors. Uh, the, the European Parliament as an institution is one. Uh, but uh, we also have a, a very rich cooperation with uh, uh, the former uh, members association, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, a partner in a project of uh, uh, oral memory, uh, which uh, we uh, really attach a great importance to. Uh, and uh, we now have uh, a new uh, generation of partnership uh, with uh, the EPP group, which uh, has generously supported the research in question. And it, I think the, the book comes uh, at the right time to emphasize indeed one key point, namely the importance uh, of uh, uh, party groups in the European Parliament. We have be news now to uh, analysis of uh, European integration that emphasized the importance gained by the parliament as a, an institutional and a political actor. But uh, it is important to open up uh, that box and to look at how uh, uh, basically the parliament has managed to gain, uh, to gain so much importance in the, the last decade. And it's clear that uh, uh, if you uh, look inside the box, uh, you realize how important the action of uh, party groups has been in that framework. Uh, this is, of course, particularly true about uh, the EPP group, uh, notably uh, because uh, it was characterized, as the, uh, the volume uh, does uh, illustrate very well, by a clear European ambition, which derives by a, a clear uh, federalist stance, uh, which is one of the hallmarks of, uh, of, of that party group in the assembly. And it's, it's clear that without that commitment, a number of things would not have happened. Uh, and by things, uh, I, I refer to formal changes in the treaties, uh, starting with the, um, the, the recognition uh, the formal recognition uh, by the Maastricht Treaty of the role of political parties in the integration uh, process, in ending uh, with political innovations uh, such as uh, the Spitzenkandidaten uh, process, uh, which uh, many people today uh, uh, declare that, but I think that is a mistake. I know that this is not uh, uh, the scope of today's debate. Uh, hopefully, we'll have other opportunities to discuss that issue. But I think that this political innovation uh, will uh, remain uh, because it, it has uh, met uh, a considerable interest and it will be difficult to replace by something uh, uh, of a different kind. 
But be that as it may, uh, I believe today's discussion uh, will illustrate uh, the importance uh, of uh, paying more attention to uh, the, the role of party groups in the European Parliament. Uh, we, of course, in, um, in the, the research in question, had the great privilege of uh, being able to rely on uh, the, the leadership role played by uh, uh, Professor Luciano Bardi, who's an emeritus professor at the University of Pisa, but uh, uh, also one of the first uh, scholars to have uh, turned his attention um, a few decades ago. Uh, I hope he won't uh, uh, mind my recalling this to uh, the, the role of political parties in the European Parliament. So I think we have quite a few ingredients uh, for an interesting discussion, uh, which is also a very timely discussion since, as you uh, know, uh, an agreement has at last been found on uh, the launching of the Conference on the Future of Europe, which will have to address inter alia uh, the question of the relationship between uh, the citizenry at large and the, uh, um, the policies of the European Union and, uh, uh, of course, uh, the role of uh, the European Parliament and of its members and of political groups uh, uh, therein will be, I'm sure, an important feature of this uh, forthcoming debate. So uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, having joined us today and I wish you all uh, an exciting discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Indeed, a very timely discussion, and I'm sure our next speaker has a lot to say about the role of the uh, political groups in the European Parliament. Please welcome the chairman of the EPP group in the European Parliament, Mr. Manfred Weber. So, Selina and Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to this uh, debate today. It's great and I think it will be absolutely exciting what we have today on the table and this exchange of views. Uh, I'm really happy about this uh, and as an APP group leader, I'm really proud that uh, we can really discuss this book today. We can present this book today. Uh, it was in 2017, in July 2017, when the research project was created. Um, and uh, the group uh, took, uh, I would say, a brave step uh, in, uh, in uh, calling for such an, such an uh, investigation, such an uh, checking about what the group did. It was a quite risky exercise and enterprise uh, to open all our archives to everyone, uh, but we did it and I must say I'm very, very happy about, about the outcome. I want to thank all those who participated, all experts, the transnational teams, uh, from the different institutions who made this work possible that we can discuss it today. And uh, really, I'm proud that no such study has been made previously from any other institution and group in the European Parliament. So that's why, again, EPP is, is the first. That's good. And if you allow me, I also want to uh, say a few special words to a few colleagues who especially contributed to this. Uh, I want to thank uh, the former Secretary General of the group, my friend Martin Kamp, who promoted and supported the project with an open mind. And uh, he knows uh, you should not only buy and read books, but sometimes you also have to enable books. And that is what he, what he did. Uh, I'm joking because whenever Martin was traveling to Strasbourg every month, uh, he bought a lot of books and he told me when he will once be retired, then he will read all these books. So that's why he knows why I'm joking about this. And I want to thank the former director of the EPP Group's presidency, it's Johann Reingartz, who has been the contact point for the research team. Thank you so much for your contribution. And also to, to Emma Petroni, who has framed and managed uh, the group's archives with uh, real dedication for many, 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 many years. Uh, thank you so much for her work. Uh, now this uh, academic uh, uh, outcome exists and we have now this research on the table. Um, and uh, that really makes me, makes me happy. You know, when we speak about this book today, then the most important point is for me as a representative of today's Christian democracy, of today's EPP, that we underline again the importance of our political uh, movement in the creation of the European Union. I'm glad to be, to be a Christian Democrat. I'm really glad about this. 
Uh, and uh, the United Europe lies really in our, in our DNA. Uh, the values count for us. Uh, the EPP is not a Christian religious group, but a group based on Christian democratic values. That is what we are. And we are bridge builders. For example, when you look to, to the religious background, then we are bridge builders. When you look to, to classes and socioeconomic groups, and when you look to the nation states, Konrad Adenauer and others, so we are bridge builders. That is what is also in our DNA. And the People's Party group uh, was always fighting for a democratic Europe. That is a third point I want to underline. The common spirit is uh, uh, not to emphasizing what splits us up, but uh, what unites us and which are not the conflict lines are important, but the bridging issues are important for us. Uh, there are some very basic principles and and you all know that the EPP uh, can also say with proudness that we have in our ranks the founding fathers of today's European Union. So Robert Schumann and uh, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, Prime Minister of Italy, Alcide de Gasperi was already mentioned. Um, they worked together uh, for forming the coal and steel community and the Christian Democratic group. Our group was founded then in June 1953 in its uh, common assembly um, and um, the European ambitions was always to build up uh, a real union uh, that is substantial with institutions. Um, for us as Christian Democrats, uh, for us as Christian democracy, the creation of a common Europe, Id European identity is based on um, personalistic values rooted in human dignity and freedom and rule of law and freedom of speech and solidarity and subsidiarity. Not a catch all group, but a group with open arms based on common values. The EPP is today the largest political group in the European Parliament and the other largest group since 1999. And uh, together with our networks, so group, party, the national parties, the representatives in the government on council side, we can really say we are an essential driver for the EU developments. And I also want to remind us on the milestones uh, which, we, which we, we must identify in regard to the EPP. The development of the EU institutions, I spoke already about this. For example, to fight for a strong European Parliament, European uh, Parliament powers. Uh, the National Conservatives were against this idea about uh, the enlargement to make Europe uh, the European Union, really a European Union. Uh, we all know that the populists were strongly against all these steps. About the European reunification, about the single market, please don't forget the Greens were heavily arguing against the single market. And uh, for the creation of the Euro, the EMU, and most recently the groundbreaking recovery and resilience fund uh, on resources, rule of law mechanism, really, really strong uh, uh, milestones in the development of the EU, which would have had been not possible without the clear support from the EPP. And uh, uh, now it's about the future, uh, because today we speak about this book and that means about our history. But we as Christian Democrats, we know that we can only speak about the, fu the future if we have good memories and good base of, uh, of, of, of the past. Um, we have recently named a building in Brussels after Sophie Scholl. She and her generation have fought for, uh, for Europe in peace and, and without hate. Kohl and Martens, and uh, let me also mention my party, Theo Weigel, have built a prosperous Europe. And, and, and we have to, I think we have to learn now out of their ambitions. And what is our step now? And that's why I was really happy to listen to President uh, Deo. Uh, I think it's really the democratic Europe. So the Spitzenkandidaten concept, the idea to really build a strong link between citizens, the individuals, our Europeans, uh, us as Europeans, and the European decision-making process. And that is what, what is now our job to do in the next upcoming, upcoming period, upcoming decisions which we have in front of us. So uh, again, I thank everyone who contributed from the researchers side, but also from our administration side in the European People's Party. I'm happy that we are the first group who can present such a book today. 
And now I'm, I'm silent, I'm listening, and I also want to learn more about our history. Thank you again, and let's have a good and exciting afternoon. Looking back to the past, to be able to look into the future. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your contribution today. I'm really looking forward to hear about the book, and that's what we're going to do now. We're going to start with our first panel today, and we're going to look into the contribution of the EPP group in the European Parliament to the socioeconomic achievements of the European project and building this beautiful uh, European Union we currently live in. And for that, I'm going to introduce uh, to you our amazing panelists. Um, please welcome uh, Martin Kamp, who is the former Secretary General of the EPP Group. Jacopo Cellini, who is a research assistant at the European University Institute. Luciano Bardi, who is a project coordinator at the European University Institute. Arianna ripoll um, who is a, sorry for that, professor at the University of Salzburg. And Paul, uh, Paolo Rangel, who is an MEP and the vice chairman of the EPP group in the European Parliament. And for that, I'm going to uh, give back the floor, and he's going to be chairing this panel today, to Dieter Slanker, who is the director of the Historical Archives of the European Union. So please, uh, Mr. Slanker, you have the floor. Yes, good afternoon. And uh, let me thank also the EPP group for organizing uh, this event uh, today, which comes uh, under very difficult circumstances. Uh, now, as director of the Historical Archives of the European Union, uh, obviously I have a very keen and a natural interest in uh, cooperating with the EU institutions, because that's our DNA, if I may say so. And so we're servicing the EU institutions since many years. Uh, the archives has been created on a decision in 1984, so we're heading towards our 40th anniversary. Uh, but the European University Institute made a step ahead, as uh, Professor de Hoos uh, rightly said, uh, in our intellectual quest. And so we created the Alcide de Gasperi Research Center in 2015 to uh, enable also to, to do actively research here at the European University Institute on uh, European integration history. And that's where we are. Uh, we launched this project uh, together with the EPP group, with whom we had uh, various relations before. We are running a joint grant program. Uh, we have privileged access to their archives in Brussels uh, through an online database. So uh, the relations have been very tight and they've been developing over years. And so uh, it came almost natural to go a step beyond and uh, do a, a research project together. So uh, I'm pleased now uh, to open this panel and to chair this first panel, which is about the questions of of, uh, why and how, why uh, a book, an academic book on the EPP group and how uh, this came around and how this was done. Um, so I would uh, like to give the floor to the former Secretary General of the EPP group, Martin Kamp, who uh, he is uh, the initiator of this uh, idea uh, with colleagues within the Secretariat. And uh, as uh, Chairman Weber uh, rightly said, uh, why did you in fact uh, turn from reading books uh, to writing them. So uh, what was your specific interest in having an academic study on the EPP group? So uh, Mr. Kamp, please, the floor is yours. Dieter, good afternoon and a pleasure to be with you all. I'm so sorry not to see you all in person. Why this book? Looking at the European studies, I, I realize that there's lots of research and uh, lots of literature, obviously, about the European Union, and in particular, also about the European Parliament. There's also enough to read about European political parties. You all know that. My question was, what about political groups? Why is their history taboo? Why is their structure taboo? Why are their policies taboo? why universities and researchers did not really study the political groups in detail. That was uh, very surprising for me because if you look uh, into what happened in Europe, the European party cooperation was practiced first by the political groups inside the European Parliament. And that started uh, in the 50s and went on in the 60s. Uh, the groups, in a way, anticipated uh, the European party building. There would be no EPP party founded in 1976 without a successful EPP group in the European Parliament before. By the way, uh, the supranational group secretariats in the European Parliament are powerhouses 
compared to the party structures until today. So why no studies about political groups? Our main ambition was therefore a new approach. We wanted to initiate a real research study and we were proud and very happy to give this project into the hands and minds of uh, leading European researchers. We wanted external observers, we wanted uh, them from different countries, we wanted them from universities, different universities, different professional backgrounds. We wanted an objective study, no pre-structured results or, or conclusions. We wanted obviously no propaganda brochure, no campaign text, simply a text written for those who can digest more than social media. And I think we got it. very much. You introduced the very interesting uh, notion, and this is uh, maybe the main notion that we have on this book, the European ambition. Uh, how did you come across this title, uh, which is very specific and very appealing? Yeah, indeed, it's uh, the European ambition. It's a wonderful title and it's an ambitious title as well. First, the result is an ambitious work. It's the first independent academic study about our group policies, about a group and about our group, so our history, our identity, our internal democratic life, our very complex transnational compromise building. The study is ambitious because we realize the need for further studies about us, but also about other political groups. Please researchers of this world look around at us and at all the other political groups. The political groups are the driving force in the European Parliament, not whoever is told to you. It's the political groups. The academic world should therefore now follow our authors, our professors, Bardi, Gagatek, Germont, Johansson and Kaiser and uh, focus on the political groups. This is, uh, in a way, a, a call for interest. There are issues for a lot of uh, PhDs and uh, master theses. Have a look. And uh, yes, the EPP was always a very ambitious group. Look at the institutional, constitutional policies described in, in, in this book. In the 80s, our members prepared exactly what was decided over the next 20 years. This group proposed a co-decision procedure. This group proposed a constitution in the early 80s already. Now we will soon start the conference on the future of Europe. Again, like 40 years ago, we are somehow lost between confusion and vision. So the ambition, the European ambition, inspires us to link the current confusion in Europe with a future vision for the European Union. I hope so. Is it so surrealist or utopian that we need this conference, followed by a convention, followed by treaty changes, and why not, by a constitution for Europe? This book is a retrospective of several decades. By reading it, by looking back, it is also an incentive to be once again more courageous and visionary in future. That's why I like this book and uh, this title in particular. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, we'll come back to the why uh, later on, but let me first turn to the how. So uh, Jacopo Cellini, who has been the research assistant for the project, uh, can you tell us a little more about uh, how the research team actually operated and how the project was uh, accomplished? Yes, well, thank you, Dieter. Uh, first of all, let me say that I am pleased to participate in this event, though I hope that we'll start doing conferences and presentation in person again soon. So to answer your question, it has already been recalled that uh, the project started in 2017 uh, when the Alcide de Gasperi Research Center uh, successfully answered to the EPP group's call for uh, a study on the group's impact on European integration. And as uh, it has been recalled, the topic had not been properly addressed by the academic literature yet. And it was also at the crossroads of different disciplines. 
This is why we set up an interdisciplinary team of scholars with historians, political scientists, uh, experts in European studies, uh, and by the way, the same combination of expertise uh, was reflected in the team of uh, research assistants. And I want to mention here the work of my colleagues, uh, Silvia Sassano, who will speak later, and Jan Karemans. Um, the composition of the research team allowed for, for a productive confrontation uh, during the course of the project. And in the end, uh, for, for a consistent book, although each chapter also stands on its own. And the goal was to deliver a multifaceted analysis of the political trajectory of the EPP group in the European Parliament, of its European ambition, but we'll get to the contents later. For my part, um, I will focus on the research phase, which is the sort of, uh, of legwork that is necessary to come to the findings, but also a legwork that got to interesting results in itself. The main result was the, was the creation of repertoires of sources and data that facilitate the study of the EPP group uh, um, in the last 40 years, so since the first direct uh, elections of the European Parliament. And uh, I can give you a few examples um, of how we did that. We created a series of data sets Mm, starting by gathering the names and partisan affiliations between uh, 1979 and today, so until the current leg legislature, of all the um, EP presidents, uh, uh, the EP vice presidents, uh, the committee chairs and vice chairs, the delegation chairs and vice chairs. And these data have been useful for all the chapters, uh, but especially for uh, Luciano Bardi's analysis of the EPP group uh, um, institutional relevance, that is the, the ability to obtain relevant institutional positions in the EP. And by the way, the calculation of the institutional strength um, within the EP was not limited to the EPP group, but it was extended to other uh, political groups for comparative purposes and especially to those belonging to the so-called core, so the socialists and the liberals to start with, whose informal cooperation has uh, historically contributed to strengthen the uh, European Parliament within the EU institutional framework. So in a sense, we already started to, to prepare the ground for other studies as uh, Martin Camp was advo advo advocating earlier. Um, well, moreover, another quick couple of examples, uh, we collected data on the national delegations within the, within the group to analyze the, the interdelegation balance. And we developed a data set concerning the EPP group uh, uh, membership in selected uh, EP committees, uh, which have then been analyzed in the chapters on the uh, European Union's internal and external policies authored by uh, Karin Germon and, and Wojciech Gagatek, but also in the chapter on the constitutionalization of the EU authored by Karl Magnus Johansson. Uh, data concerned um, the distribution of the group representatives within the committees, but also their, uh, their voting behavior on, on relevant topics. Also in this case, uh, the data were not limited to the EPP group, but they included also other political groups. So in the end, um, we, we set up a collection of data that has deepened uh, our understanding of the group's trajectory within the, the, the EP, and that can also be useful to carry out further research on, uh, on political groups in the, in the European Parliament. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Jacopo, for this information. Now, uh, as uh, Chairman Weber said, um, we're talking about a very brave step that the EPP group has taken because it opened its archives, uh, its internal archives uh, for the uh, scholars to do their work. And also we here at the Historical Archives of the European Union made as much material available as possible. So what was the relevance and the use of archival uh, documents for the research? Uh, yes, um, there was a, um, a politological side to the research, but also a historical uh, side. And uh, historians of Christian democracy, like myself, uh, note that one of the major problems uh, facing the scholars is the, is the fragmentation of sources uh, between different archives um, and different countries. 
This research project could count on the cooperation between the EPP Group Archives in Brussels, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, in St. Augustine, where most of the sources of international and, um, and European Christian democracy are held, uh, including those of the EPP Group in the original, and the historical archives of the European Union in Florence, from where we speak, which hold the archives of EU institutions and therefore also the papers of the European Parliament, uh, among others. Uh, so um, we were able to digitize hundreds of documents, thanks to the help from, the, from our partners, especially from Emma Petroni in Brussels, um, who is responsible for the archives of the EPP group. And uh, well, at the time, uh, we didn't have to deal with the pandemic, fortunately. So we were able to travel between Brussels and Florence to coordinate and organize the research work. In any case, the digitization of documents proved useful for a research team that was spread out uh, between different countries. Um, and well, many of the documents from the EPP group were made available uh, for the first time, uh, from the presidency to the bureau meetings uh, to the political notes for the plenary. Some of the files have been marked uh, confidential, which means that they are not yet available for uh, all the researchers, but they were shared with the research team within the context of this project. So they gave uh, um, a special insight on the group's functioning that, that could be gained by relying uh, only on, uh, on published sources. And these allowed for a more nuanced analysis. Uh, all the chapters uh, rely on these sources, most notably Wolfram Kaiser's, uh, whose study also deals with the, with the history of the group uh, before 1979, but also the, the chapters on EU internal policies and, uh, and on its constitutionalization. And we could also make use of another kind of historical um, testimonies uh, that is on oral sources. Uh, all the authors interviewed uh, uh, current and uh, former uh, EPP members, uh, EPP groups uh, support staff, as well as other um, informed observers and experts in order to, to obtain an eyewitness account on some key moments in the history of the group, but also some insights on its day-to-day -day functioning. These interviews uh, could also be integrated with uh, those included in the oral history program of the historical archives of the European Union, which collects the, the voices of European politicians and officials whose testimonies uh, have been used for different projects uh, on the history of uh, European institutions published in recent years. So to, to sum it up, mm, this was uh, one accomplishment of the research project, the creation of a series of, uh, of repositories that collect data and sources on the EPP group, but also on other political groups. In the, in the parliament. This, of course, is a standard procedure for, for any academic project, but I would like to close by saying that this collection helped making a step forward in the scientific literature on European political parties, which prior to this had rarely uh, relied on uh, primary sources. And so this has been a successful test of a research framework that can be used and fine-tuned uh, in the future to study not only other political groups in the European Parliament, but also the, the interaction between them. Uh, let me now turn to Professor Luciano Bardi, who coordinated this research project uh, from the outset. Uh, Professor Bardi, can you tell us about the specific disciplinary approach and methodology uh, that was used for this research project, please? The floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dieter, for giving me the floor. Uh, I also want to thank uh, very deeply the other friends at the EPP group who took the initiative of launching this project and made it possible. It was a pleasure, I would say also an honor for me to coordinate it. So I'm very pleased to be here today. The research project uh, that produced the book, uh, I don't have a copy right here, but you <laughs> can see it. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dieter has one next to me. Uh, uh, the book relied on a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, as you heard already, the two, main, uh, the two main disciplines involved or represented in the book, in the project in the book, are history and political science and uh, the wealth of data that we accessed and produced 
uh, is a testimony to this uh, uh, dual uh, nature of our disciplinary uh, concerns. However, the team members had uh, other, besides history and political science, also other competences. So I would say that the analysis takes advantage also of uh, law and uh, politi uh, political sociology competences. As uh, Professor De Hoos, uh mentioned at the beginning, uh, here at the UI there's a very long history of uh, research on the European Parliament. And so this tradition goes back to the study of what you call an elite population, uh, such as the MEPs who were first targeted by the EOI back in 1983. So uh, I so that's how many decades ago we started studying this. Uh, 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 Professor De Hoos was hesitant in telling you uh, uh, how many. Well, I'm telling you. So it's uh, we are on our fourth decade now, actually approaching the end of it. So uh, uh, given uh, this uh, multidisciplinary. Um, uh, composition of the team, uh, we uh, applied a multifaceted uh, methodological strategy that consisted of historical uh, analysis, single case studies, uh, which were especially important for uh, the chapter written by uh, Karl Magnus Johansson, and also of course comparative methods. And comparative methods which were prominent in my own chapter, but were present also in the policy chapters, and I would say uh, uh, to an extent also in the uh, historical chapter by uh, Wolfram Kaiser. So um, the bottom line then is that the EPP group was studied and analyzed across time and at important uh, political junctures, uh, in selected cases, of course, and uh, I would say also, and very importantly, in relation to other political groups. As, uh, as Jacobo mentioned, uh, we are now in a position to say we have the instruments to perhaps approach other groups, uh, already departing from the work we have already done. Now, talking about the objectives of the book, uh, how did you, uh, during your research, conceptualize and uh, operationalize the title given on the European ambition? Uh, I'm very happy that you asked this question. Uh, uh, European ambition, of course, uh, is a very catchy and I would say very nice title. Uh, it does reflect the ambition uh, of not only of the group, but also the ambition of the research team, the ambition of the project. However, uh, we had to put uh, some meat on, on this, and uh, uh, we uh, soon realized through discussions within the groups that uh, the European ambition is something that consists of values slash ideals, objectives, and means slash instruments of values. Uh, uh, the, the chair of the EPP group, Mr. Baber, already told us uh, about the Christian democratic values of the group, but certainly these values are also at the basis of the European ambition of the group uh, uh, in actuality, and you can really see it in the everyday behavior of the group uh, in, its, in the many arenas in which it operates. Uh, so Christian values, principles and ideals are really at the basis of this whole uh, enterprise. Uh, Christian values as understood in a universalistic manner. Uh, that is based on the notion of human dignity. The implication of this then, of course, is uh, twofold. Democracy, so 
Christian values, Christian democracy, but also a Christian vision of uh, supranationality. And so that's why the ambition is not only Christian, but is also European. Huh? So there is a, a number of uh, uh, value and ideals and, uh, and we, as we will see objectives that crisscross here. Um, then there is the institutional objective. Huh? Uh, having said all of this about the values, what is the objective of the European ambition? And the objective of the European ambition is a European federal state through a gradual or gradualistic, if you prefer, approach in the Jean Monnet uh, tradition. Huh? So not much is new here, but it's very important that we point this out, that we stress this point. There is also a, an intermediate institutional objective which of course sometimes appears to be the most important one and uh, because it is a means to achieve the primary one. And this uh, intermediate objective is the strengthening and empowerment of the European Parliament. Huh? So we get to the federal state, this is the, uh, what we were able to observe in the various articulations of the European ambition, if the parliament becomes more prominent vis-a-vis -vis the other European Union institutions and in a way also vis-a-vis -vis the member states. So uh, you can see here that there's an implication in the long term for a parliamentarization of the European Union. Uh, and of course, the Spitzenkandidaten uh, strategy uh, could be part of it, but as has already been said, it is not for us to talk about this today. Okay. Um, how was the objective pursued? I still, I still think I have a couple of minutes so I can, can do that. Uh, there are two really, uh, two ways in which the uh, uh, EPP group has pursued, has pursued these objectives uh, through organizational means and through political means. Organizationally, uh, the uh, EPP group has pursued the European ambition uh, by trying to maintain, achieve and maintain a strong presence uh, in uh, a, a prevalence, I should say, uh, in, within the EPP. And for the last five, uh, five uh, terms, if I'm not mistaken, the EPP group has been the largest one in the European, in the European Parliament. But also, uh, the other aspect is to have a pervasive presence in all member states. And, uh, and this is reflected in the EPP, EPP group's uh, relentless and often successful efforts to attract sister parties in new member states across successive enlargements. Finally, political means and strategy. Uh, uh, basically, uh, since we are not here to uh, uh, hide anything that we have observed and found, uh, the EPP group aims at achieving uh, hegemony uh, in the European Parliament. There's nothing wrong about that. Uh, and this is done th through assertive activism, strong institutional presence. Jacopo has already mentioned how we have, uh, how we have uh, studied and analyzed that. But I would say the most important aspect is the political alliances. Uh, political alliances uh, that are meant to lead to an understanding, if not altogether, to an alliance of the historically more important groups in the European Parliament, that is, besides the EPP, also the Socialists, S&D uh, now, and the Liberals. Uh, more recently, the Greens have been approached as well and be made part of this, uh, and this is something that we could see evolve into something more permanent. 
So the existence of these convergences promoted, I would say, by the EPP group clearly represent the most important finding in my own chapter, which I will not present later, so I'll just uh, give you uh, uh, a couple of uh, hints here as to what you may find in it, uh, which led me to characterize uh, this understanding as the constitution of a core in the European party system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luciano. So uh, we will turn away from, from the project team now and uh, turn to uh, two guest speakers that we invited, Ariadna Ripoll, Servant, and Paolo Rangel, who uh, would play uh, the critical voice and uh, what we would in a, a scholarly environment call a discussions. So I would first like to ask Ariadna, uh, who has uh, received the book and read the book, uh, what is your idea about the book and what do you think are the main contributions of this research? Well, uh, thank you, Dieter, for the question. And also thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, discuss the book, which I thought was extremely interesting. And as some of the of the people who presented before already said, it's, it's, a, it's a very important contribution. There is indeed an important gap in research in terms of uh, political groups uh, of the European Parliament. So I think in this sense, it's a really uh, great piece of, of interdisciplinary work. Um, it allows us to open up um, this, this kind of black box of the of the political groups which often are treated as, as unitary actors um, so i think that it's very important that we can uh, really see in a historical perspective also uh, the the the, the uh, internal struggles the up and downs how uh, the these up and downs also are connected very much to national politics, to the destiny of individual uh, parties. So I think this is fascinating. I, I think it's also very important that this interdisciplinary work, so that the idea that it mixes uh, history, law, uh, political science, that it gives us also his perspective of individual actors. So how um, uh, individual people with their um, specific careers, personal backgrounds, um, historical context, how they could make a, a really important difference to uh, the history of the European Parliament and of uh, European um, integration. So, so how um, we, we still now live with legacies in, of, of um, innovations and ideas is introduced by individual people. So I think that that is often very much forgotten when we look at uh, processes of um, European integration. Um, and also what I think it's a very uh, important contribution is to uh, look uh, at what Professor Vardy was uh, saying now about the importance of the EPP as one of uh, members of this core of the European Parliament, but how um, this this um, attempt at hegemony probably is not just a, an issue in, inside the European Parliament, but also is an ambition beyond the European Parliament and, and across the EU's political system and how important there all these political networks, um, linkages with uh, national parties, with other EPP actors beyond the EP have been really essential in, in building, um, uh, the, empowering the, the European Parliament, but also um, pushing the process of European integration further. So Ariadna, you told us uh, uh, what would be the contribution and basically what is in the book, but what, what uh, do you think is not in the book and what could be explored further in, uh, in future research? Well, I think I, I see three main points there. I mean, the, the first one is that because there's a lot of uh, focus on the history of the group, some some uh, more recent um, evolutions are a bit uh, forgotten, and especially the the, the recent um, the recent conflicts uh, within the group, especially with uh, some Central and Eastern European parties, and and of course the the elephant in the room, which is the the Fidesz uh, national dele and delegation. This uh, is probably not as uh, present as it could be. And I think it's, it's important to discuss this. It's important to discuss uh, to what extent the EPP has contributed also to legitimizing certain uh, regimes of, of electoral autocr autocracies like Kellerman 
calls them and also emphasizing a bit this this trends of democratic backsliding in some european countries and i mean so, so some of the previous speakers were talking about this European ambition and so how the, the presence of these uh, parties within the EPP and how the EPP has dealt with this, how this also affects a bit its capacity to hold the core to really still um, show this ambition and, and show that it can continue to be a motor for integration, that it can, that it's still credible when it talks about all this kind of Christian values uh, on all these ideas of, of pr uh, protecting human rights, protecting democracy and so on. The second point, which is a bit linked to that as well, is um, about how um, the EPP has also transformed within a broader context of uh, more politicized, more fragmented national uh, political systems. So we see now that uh, Christian democratic and conservative parties struggle often uh, at the domestic level, that they have to also position themselves um, on certain issues vis-a-vis -vis especially far-right parties. And this often has also meant that the, the EPP has not always been a, a motor for integration, that it has sometimes also contributed to deadlock or to blocking integration. And I mean, for instance, I've looked at the, at the area of uh, migration and there we've seen that many um, uh, EPP governments, but also the EPP group have been very reluctant in advancing integration in this area and that often it has adopted or, or copied the message uh, of the far right, so adopted this kind of anti-immigration uh, language. So the, I think this is important also to bear in mind that it's not always a positive contribution, but that there are um, areas in which the EPP can also um, act as a, as a break to integration or uh, slowing uh, it down. And my, and my last point, and this is very short, but it, it kind of resonates with what uh, has been said before about um, using this as kind of a, 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 a springboard for further research on political groups. And I think that one, one thing, and, and it's probably normal that um, in the book um, comes up very clearly is that the, the EPP voices are very strong, are very dominant, which is normal due to the um, to the partners, the uh, interview partners, to the sources. And I think it could be really interesting to now confront these um, findings, confront these uh, uh, this, this, uh, explanations to also other types of actors, uh, actors outside the EPP, also compared to what uh, other groups have to say about the same processes, about the same uh, history. So, so I think that that could be really, really interesting for the future. But thank you very much. It was really fascinating to read. Thank you, Ariadna. And we will close this panel with uh, a testimony and uh, an actor in the European Parliament, Paolo Rangel, uh, who's also chairing the Future of the Europe uh, Conference. So, uh, Mr. Rangel, uh, hearing a lot about uh, the past, how do you think can the book help uh, maybe transmitting this uh, European ambition uh, to the younger generations, which uh, you will, uh, this is your main task in the Future of Europe Conference. Thank you very much. Well, first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, let me say that uh, I have a very strong uh, tie with uh, the Institute in Florence. Uh, I remember in the 90s when I was writing my academic works, I was uh, uh, plenty of times in Fiesole consulting the library, uh, sometimes for weeks, not as a, a student of the Institute, but as a visitor, I'd say. And then let me also stress something that is very peculiar, very, I'd say, uh, special uh, in EPP group, uh, and that is, uh, I'd say, very well documented by our session today, is that we had in our staff a lot of people that were very, I'd say, high-ranked intellectuals and that uh, were reading and uh, all the, 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 the new articles and books on, on, on Europe and that is the case of Martin Kamp and Johan Reingart. So when you have a, a staff that should be probably more technocratic or bureaucratic, but that has, that has really, uh, I'd say, an intellectual uh, background, and a vision 
then of course uh, this shows how, why and how EPP group uh, became so strong. Then let me point out two uh, main uh, conclusions that I took from this book and that uh, can then help me to answer to your very concrete question. First one that is very important and that I think that should be studied uh, in more detail is that what you see at European political level uh, in the formation of European parties is more or less the same that happened with national parties in the 19th century. The parties started in the parliament. So they started outside the electorate. They came from the parliament to the society and not from the society to the parliament. And we are still at European level in this stage. All the party politics that is really important is only played at parliament level. And this is something that is quite interesting because it seems to imitate and to reply what happened uh, at national uh, sphere, at national environment in the early Ottocento, to use the Italian word. Uh, so this is something that I think that we should uh, reflect on. Uh, if, if this is true, and if it is true, what this means, and if this gives us a hope that we can have really European parties. A second conclusion that the different articles, especially the ones that go to policies or to some institutional improvements and sophistication or achievements, uh, really teach us is that uh, European Parliament is always acting and here EPP is the driving force. I have to say that no, this is not a partisan, uh, I'd say, stance. There is no group and there is no party that has the sophistication, the degree of development of EPP. This is quite clear, even if you look at socialists or liberals, it's, it's, we are already in a, a different uh, uh, stage. But this is important to say the whole parliament and especially these groups that are the more pro-European ones, uh, what they have done since the very beginning is something that is very uh, similar to the experience of the British Parliament across the centuries. That is to use some mechanisms, to use some tools that were not meant to one purpose in order to uh, 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 gain to, to obtain new competences and new powers. I can give you even some examples of the very, very recent uh, developments. For instance, to grant that uh, uh, Commission van der Leyen would respect the demands on legislative initiative of the parliament before the vote of van der Leyen, that was a quite tight one, was only eight, we obliged them, her, to grant to the plenary that she would give follow-up to our requests, what in a certain way is creating a kind of indirect legislative initiative. By the way, it's quite similar to something that happened in the 14th and 15th century in, in the British Parliament, uh, where the, uh, uh, especially the Commons, the House of Commons, has this tax competence and obliged the King to give legislative initiative to the Parliament uh, and as, a, uh, I'd say, a kind of a reward, they would approve new taxes. So they use the competence, the, the fiscal one, the tax one, to acquire political competences. Or for instance, they use the impeachment in the British experience to uh, create what we call today a political most, uh, censorship motion, because they started to use so frequently the impeachment 
that there was no criminal accusation behind the use of this tool, and it became too political. I'm giving this example also, for instance, for something that is now with this uh, fund, this new fund for the pandemic that was created outside the budget rules. And so where the scrutiny of the parliament is quite, I say, uh, irrelevant, but as we had the competence to approve the own resources decision that was made in September 16th, I, think, I believe, 2020, we said, okay, we will approve this with two conditions. First, we want a rule of law uh, 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 regulation. Without that, we won't give our authorization to own, own uh, resources decision. And second, we want to have some capacity of scrutinizing the implementation of this fund. And uh, 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 these two conditions were met, and then we voted. So we used a competence, a power, that is not really meant for this in order to change the balance of powers between council and parliament, and sometimes between commission and parliament. For instance, I was rapporteur in 2010 for the framework agreement between the commission and the parliament, where the commission became much more responsible towards the parliament, uh, I would say much more accountable, and the council is outside of this agreement, and even the council was thinking of uh, taking this to court, of suiting the two institutions, but they didn't, they didn't dare to that. Why? Because the wisdom of the political groups and of the European Parliament is always to play this game in the borderline. It is not clear if it is constitutional or inconstitutional, if it is uh, under the treaties or over the treaties. And then it's risky to go to court because if Luxembourg court says this is according to the treaties, then the council will lose definitely this prerogative. And this is only to say that we have a lot of examples all across the book of these tendencies of using some competences to uh, uh, regain power, to uh, grow the influence of the parliament. And so uh, I say that uh, uh, this doesn't answer to your question, but as I, I was too long, I can do it in your second question. Okay, well, uh, dear uh, Mr. Rangel, I, I have to close. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, so, but this was very instructive, and I'm sure this is uh, enough food for a second volume uh, on the uh, on the EPP group. So, thank you very much for these uh, for these uh, very uh, interesting ideas and uh, stimulating uh, and thought-provoking um, themes. Now, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, for their contributions and uh, I would give back to the moderator Beatriz Rios who will now uh, take us to the second panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, a very insightful discussion. A lot of food for thought and a lot of material indeed for a follow-up book. I'm also hopeful that other political parties take on in the idea and they decide themselves to open their archives for the researchers to do their own story. Uh, indeed, as Mr. Camp was suggesting before. Thank you again to our panelists today for their contributions. And now we'll be back in a second for the next panel. We're going to have now the second panel, but before, let me remind you that you can ask your questions. You can be part of the conversation. We're using the hashtag European Ambition on Twitter, but we're also live on YouTube, both in the channels of the European uh, People's Group Party uh, Group in the European Parliament uh, and the European University Institute. So share your questions for our panelists today. Now we're going to get back into the book, The European Ambition, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how the book was conceived and how the research 
Ventures worked on it. And for that, please let me welcome Silvia Sassano, who is a visiting, uh, fellow, visiting fellow at the European University Institute, Wolfram uh, Kaiser, who is a professor at the University of Portsmouth, um, Karl Magnon Johansson, who is a professor in Southerton University, Karin Germon, who is a professor of the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and Wolfram Gagex, uh, who is assistant professor, uh, assistant professor at the University of Warsaw and for this discussion, uh, we welcome as well Daniele Caramani, who is the professor and a director of the European Governance and Politics Program at the European University Institute in Florence, and he will be sharing this panel. So please, Mr. Caramani, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and a very warm welcome also from, uh, from me. My name is Daniele Caramani, and I am a professor at the UI, and I hold the chair, uh, which is named after Ernst Haas, uh, a very important scholar, uh, who was the father of neo-functionalism, uh, an approach that is quite closely linked to Monet's vision uh, on gradualism. And uh, Ernst Haas suggested already in 1958 that parties and groups are essential to the EU political system. I'm therefore very uh, happy and I feel very privileged to moderate this roundtable on a book on the European People's Party Group and its role on European integration. Silvia Sassano reminds us of the importance of, uh, or, uh, that has attributed to parties and groups in the introduction to this uh, uh, volume, uh, an introduction that she has written together with Luciano Baldi. Silvia, therefore, let me start with you and ask you about your uh, motivation for the book and uh, your motivation in launching and uh, uh, leading this research project. Uh, thank you, Daniele. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please let me say that I'm very glad and proud to be presenting this book today and of this research project. And I want to thank uh, the um, EPP group for their support and then trust, and also the Alcide de Gasperi Research Center for uh, giving me the opportunity to be involved in this project since the very beginning. So, um, the, the articulation, so, um, yes, the, the articulation of this book in, into five chapters that the authors will present, it, uh, will present right now, um, was determined by the decision to make an interdisciplinary research and to analyze the EPP group's impact uh, on the European integration from different perspectives. Uh, Luciano Bardi and Martin Camp, before they have explained uh, the meaning of this uh, European ambition, and uh, accepting and responding to the stimulus coming from the EPP group, uh, we we decide to um to, to respond to this European ambition uh, in order to, to have a book that can provide the audience, both the wider public and the scientific community, with a critical analysis um, investigating two main points. From one end, uh, we wanted to uh, analyze the uh, history, the, the EPP group's history, political and organization evolu organizational evolution, its strategic view of Europe from 1979 onwards, and its role as a crucial actor of, uh, um, of the EU party system, and its relationship with other uh, political and institutional actors, as well as informal and informal uh, networks. Then, second second point of this analysis was to to analyze the, uh, the EPP group's influence on the crucial moments of the European integration history, uh, namely the EU, uh, uh, EU treaties reforms and the policy making process. And uh, I want to stress here that, uh, that the analysis also take into account uh, if and how the European integration improvements, such as the enforcement of the European uh, Parliament, has played a role in um, in, in, in the, uh, with regards to the ability of the EPP group to exert its influence. So we have these two elements, the, uh, e the European integration process building and the influence of the um, 
the influence of the EPP group, and uh, we can see that the, um, the empowerment, the EP empowerment was not only an objective of the EPP group, but was also an instrument used by the group in order to, uh, to achieve a more integration, uh, to go forward uh, in, the, in the European integration. And uh, this issue is running through all five chapters, as the author will, uh, will explain uh, in a few minutes. So um, this idea, this motivation, uh, this challenge, because because it was also a challenge for us uh, to make the to make this book, uh, has been translated into concrete uh, in the in this book divided in five chapters. Um, so the content, as well as the approach used for each chapter, uh, give this concrete answer. And I will just say something briefly about each of these chapter, uh, just to introduce what the uh, the author will say about the funding. So. First chapter, uh, authored by uh, Wolfram Kaiser, discusses the history of the EPP group in the European Parliament from its origins to the Maastricht Treaties, uh, treaty beginning with the Christian Democracy Transnational uh, Cooperation right after the Second World War. And in this chapter, Kaiser uh, analyzed the group composition, its, info, its, uh, its internal governance, and its relationship with the EPP Central Party Organization and the other political group groups in the European Parliament. We have just listened from the others how important is the relation with the with the other political groups. And then uh, Kaiser focuses on the role of the EPP group on shaping EU system building and policy making. Then the second chapter, uh, written by Carl Magnus Johansson, explores the role of the EPP group within the constitutionalization process. And the author say that, uh, um, says that uh, this process has characterized the European communities and the European Union uh, from mid-1980s to the late uh, 2000s, and uh, it, it has established a sort of near permanent, uh, permanent internal um, intergovernmental conference, or, or as Luciano Bardi says, the seasons of the treaties. So the aim of this chapter, this chapter is to analyze the contribution of the EPP group within the negotiation uh, leading to the adoption of the um, EU treaties reforms. So it focuses on the six reform and uh, six case studies about the EU um, treaties reform. So we have single European Act, Maastricht, uh, Amsterdam, Nice, Constitutional, and the Lisbon Treaty. And for each of, of these cases, the author investigates the formal and informal relationship between the treaty making process, the EPP group, and its network. And then we, we move briefly to the third and fourth chapters, and they are devoted to the internal and the external policies. And uh, both authors, they analyze this impact of the EPP group within the policy making process uh, by focusing on three main elements. So first, uh, which, value, which uh, values, uh, which groups values has been, uh, were, um, uh, were, were expressed? So which were the values? How these values uh, have been translated in the, in the concrete mm -hmm. objectives and which were the results at the end? And here, let me say that as a selection should have been made, especially for internal policy, uh, we selected some areas that we consider mm -hmm. more, most relevant for this study. Nevertheless, uh, European policies that have not been included in these studies in this study still remain of, uh, of interest for further studies in this direction. So the third chapter, uh, written by Karine Germo, focuses on agricultural, economic and monetary, social and environmental policies, and uh, these are of st strategic importance for the EPP group, uh, both for its, um, its electoral weight and also for its programmatic, programmatic objective of um, uh, co completing the internal market. And and if we want to find a fil rouge among these policies, this can be uh, identified in the continuous equilibrium that they, these policies require between a liberalization and social measures intended to moderate the effects of uh, liberalization. Then the fourth chapter, uh, Wojciech Gagatek, 
focuses on the broader area of external relations. So common foreign security policy, common security and defense policy, common commercial policy, def um, develop development policy, and EU enlargements. And um, in line with the entire book, uh, also this chapter and its findings are something, something completely new in the literature. And this is due also to the fact that uh, apart from the, commercial, the common commercial policy, the rest of the policies are are, um, are characterized by the, uh, an intergovernmental approach. So in these cases, we know uh, the, uh, the contribution of the European Parliament is quite limited. So it means that it uh, was not an easy work to identify the, uh, e the EP uh, group's position, and especially the EPP group's position, but the, the author uh, succeeded in, uh, in doing so. And finally, the chapter authored by uh, Luciano Bardi, Luciano already said something, uh, and it concentrates on the group's role as a crucial component of the EU party system and its core, and he made a quantitative analysis uh, in order to assess the group's institutional impact and the positioning uh, within the EPP party's wider organization. And he also analyzed the relations with, uh, all the, with the other institutions, namely Commission and the European Council and, European, um, and the Council of European Union. Thank you, Silvia. Um, it, it transpires from what you say and also from reading the book that there are some themes that um, run through the, these, uh, these chapters. Um, it makes for a very integrated uh, uh, reading and one of these elements is transnational uh, cooperation. Uh, Wolfram Kaiser, let me turn to you. You authored a fascinating account of, of the origins of this transnational cooperation among Christian democratic parties in, in Europe and in your chapter you, co you cover the work of this group from the early 50s, if not even uh, trying to identify some origin earlier, uh, earlier than, than that. Um, and you seem to identify the direct election of the European Parliament as a crucial, crucial uh, moment. What, in your view, was the impact of the first direct elections uh, in 1979 on the EPP group? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there were significant changes that took place after the direct elections of 1979. First of all, the group nearly doubled in size and very few dual mandates were left and only for a very short period of time. So the MEPs who are now exclusively members of the European Parliament, of course, wanted to have something to do and to also co-decide, if possible, not just on the budget, where, of course, the European Parliament already had some powers, but also on legislation and policy making. Uh, what we observe for the period after 79 is that there's a strong process of internal professionalization, the growth of the group administration in line with the group size doubling, the structure of the group officials with responsibility for policy areas is developed in this period, and there's also a new revised structure of working groups to follow and to anticipate the work of the European Parliament committees. We also see that there's a degree of politicization, despite the fact that the European Parliament does not yet have, at this point, formal powers over legislation, only the budget. And this process of in, incipient process of politicization is also reflected in stronger competition for positions within the European Parliament in the EP committees and especially the EP presidency. After Egon Klepsch, the German group leader lost the 1982 EP presidency election. This politicization also showed in the rapprochement of the EPP group with the socialist group to form an informal coalition after 1986-88. This to secure EPP group influence over EP decision making in the absence of a center-right majority initially after the 1986 enlargement to include Spain and Portugal. But in my chapter, I'm also trying to bring out important continuities after 1979. So first of all, the EPP group was negatively impacted by the enlargements of 1973 and 1986, at least in the short and medium term, in terms of its size and its influence in the European Parliament due to the lack of Christian democratic sister parties in the new member states. Hence, the group continued to be dominated after 1979 by three distinct subgroups in the EP group, EPP group, the German and Italian national delegations and also the Benelux MEPs who largely coordinated their efforts. French MEPs only accounted for 5% of the EPP group. 
The German and Italian delegations, in contrast, dominated the group in the 1980s. 1979, they had 40 percent and 28 percent of the membership. In the 1989, 70. Uh, 27, sorry, and 23 percent. So together we're still forming just about majority of the group. The group had German leaders for 22 of 27 years between 1965 and 1992, most uh, prominently and notably Klebsch for 12 and a half years, the longest time that uh, an EPP group chairman has ever served in this role. And the group only had Italian secretary generals complementing this between 1965 and 1990, most prominent, prominently Betamio between 1976 and 86. So there was very close German-Italian cooperation in the EPP group in this period, and this constituted an important counterweight, I would say, to close Franco-German cooperation at the governmental level. Group leader Klepsch, for example, acted as a go-between for Deci contacts for the German CDU leader and chancellor after 1982, Helmut Kohl. So we might say in conclusion that the EPP group in this period was, if you like, small and beautiful. Throughout the 1980s, Klepsch and the EPP group developed a strategy of expansion to include parties in the new member states. This eventually led to the accession of the Partido Popular in Spain, the Portuguese Social Democrats, and also the cooperation with the British Conservatives, but all of this only happened from the early 1990s onwards. And this enlargement process made the EPP group eventually more powerful in the European Parliament, but it also made it far more heterogeneous, as recent events have shown in quite dramatic fashion. Um. Thank you, uh, Wolfram. Very quickly, if I may follow up, you spoke about increasing competition and politicization. Um, and this, uh, I, I understood, requires unity from, from the group. And uh, in the 80s, there was such uh, unity. Um, how does unity or uh, a, a, an, in, an increasing heterogeneity impact uh, the politics and the policy making? Yes, I think because the EPP group was relatively small and quite cohesive, it was clear in the 1980s that it was able to exercise significant influence due to shared policy concerns. These included, for example, the common agricultural policy. But I think the most important contribution of the EPP group in this period was no doubt, and other speakers have referred to this before, its strong and unified support for the creation of a federal Europe of sorts. And this support was embedded in the party's early post-war cooperation. It was strengthened by the self-selection of strongly pro-integration politicians as candidates for EP elections. And it was more easily protected at the time because of the slow enlargement of the EPP group to include other parties on the center-right with different political traditions and institutional preferences. The group's broadly federalist preference was reflected in its strong eventual support for the European Parliament's draft treaty on European Union 1984, its dominant role in the Political Affairs Committee and the Institutional Affairs Committee, although I didn't share the letter, the letter one, its role in multiple European Parliament reports about the reform of the communities, and also, lastly, its strong lobbying of national governments to support this process, especially in the context of the Maastricht Treaty in the early 1990s. So throughout the 1980s, the EPP group remained in essence a kind of core Europe group. It was dominated by MEPs from the founding member states with strongly federalist commitments. To paraphrase, paraphrase if you like, Francis Fukuyama, the EPP group experienced the end of the Cold War and the Maastricht Treaty as its own version of a kind of end of history, namely as the decisive breakthrough towards a more federalist, democratic, and pan-continental Europe. These arguments about policy making uh, that you make, Wolfram, uh, lead me to the next question about one of the most important roles that parties uh, have, namely in policy making, uh, and in particular in treaty reforms. Um, Karl Magnus Johansson, um, I turn now to your chapter. Would you agree that parties have a role in institutional report, reform? And more specifically, what about the autonomy uh, of the group in constitutional matters? You address them in your uh, chapter, as well as the divisions within, within the 
group? Um, how strong were they? Carl, uh, can you hear me? Now? Yes. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> These technical things. I mean, to begin with, I think it's clear from my chapter that uh, it, uh, the EPP group mostly comes out as um, an influential uh, player, right? I think this is very obvious, but even, or not always, an, uh, uh, a unitary actor, as we touched upon uh, in, in passing here in this uh, seminar. Uh, obviously, there are divisions and so on, and I think it's very important to say that if you try to theorize influence, it's always difficult, as we all know, to estimate, to assess influence, right? But I think it's clear here that we can say, as I do in my chapter, that influence is uh, bounded somehow, is conditional on a number on, of factors or conditions, such as numerical strength, cohesion, and also, say, mobilization capacity. This is a very important factor, right? Which the EPC, EPP and the group and the party have clearly demonstrated over the years that they have, have this as a, as a main resource, perhaps, right? Not just the numerical strength and the cohesion, but also this mobilization capacity. It's a very important resource that I would like to mention here. But obviously, to answer the question about autonomy here, in general, I would say that it can be difficult to draw a line between influence exerted by Euro parties, that is the political parties at the European level, and European Parliament uh, groups. But I conclude here, anyway, that uh, the EPP group and party, both of these entities, so to say, seemed, or I think I dare say were, very much in sync uh, throughout the treaty reform processes that I covered, that Sylvia mentioned from the 1980s uh, onward. I think this is, this is very clear. Um, and to say which of these two have been more influential than the other, I think it's, a, it's an impossible task, right? This could also vary over the years, but it's clear, as we've heard previous speakers say today, that there have been a joint cause right, uniting these entities, which has been, of course, close to European integration in general, and specifically relating to some policy areas, which you mentioned, and not least, and this I would like to emphasize as previous speakers, the role of the EP itself. It's a fundamental achievement, right, this strengthening of the European Parliament. I think it was not maybe generally recognized what the single European Act made uh, in this regard by strengthening the European Parliament and acting as a kind of incentive for party groups to join forces, right? And to seek cohes cohesion. So I think this is something that we see in terms of, which I find interesting because it's a bit sometimes uh, frustrating to write a chapter like this with all, you know, the details and policy proposals, suggestion, everything. But in terms of substantive continuity, I think here you see a clear instance of substantive continuity over these uh, uh, successive treaty reforms, right? And as we know, and, and some colleagues of, colleagues of us have convincingly shown, the European Parliament has been the winner, not least in the Amsterdam Treaty, right? And I think the implications of this, and Luciani also men mentioned this, is of course far-reaching in terms of the effect these institutional changes have on um, behavior, right? Political group behavior and um, individual behavior within the groups as such. Uh, so I think this is very important. Then just to finalize this question on the, on the autonomy, which is also somehow relating to broader questions of power here, and is the question of resources, which I mentioned, and Martin Kamp mentioned this, that in many ways the European Parliament groups, here the EPP group, 
has a clear advantage in terms of the resources they um, they have in terms of uh, staffing personnel, right? In infrastructure, broadly speaking. But don't forget that the EPP, as a party, they have also the uh, links, networks to national uh, parties and, of course, to government leaders, right? Yes, that's what uh, was, I was going to ask uh, next, if you could very, very briefly about the constraints, um, because you speak about this important role that the EPP played uh, uh, and how, um, uh, how strong were the pushbacks against this, uh, uh, these, these reforms to which the EPP contributed? Well, it's clear, as we all aware, that uh, over time, we had, as Wolfram mentioned, the enlargement of the EPP as such and the group, of course, it, divisions grew, obviously, within the group. Also, not just from Central European uh, countries later, but also from the Nordic countries, as we are aware. From where I am now, here in Stockholm, with, <laughs> with the party headquarters, you will find very few politicians, so on, who would support these uh, uh, ambitions, right, of closer European integration along federalist lines. So, so this is very, very clear. Um, and of course, um, inevitably, um, just, I just want to finish by saying this, that inevitably you will have these power asymmetries. And I think, as was mentioned earlier, maybe this is something that should be recognized or researched more in the future, right? The internal power distributions and asymmetries within, um, within the, the group. Thank you. Um, we need to uh, move on as we are running uh, late. But I would like to come back to some fundamental factors driving the EPP. And uh, Karine Germont, uh, your chapter deals with European-wide ideas underpinning this uh, action. And uh, I would like to ask you, what would you identify as the main ideational legacy of the EPP group? Thank you very much, uh, Daniele. I think we've talked quite quite a, a bit in uh, in in the past uh, contribution uh, to this workshop about the role of played by values and and principles and and ideas. And I think these uh, in my chapter and and in these four uh, internal policy uh, mentioned by Sylvia, we do see uh, very well. Uh, what is this intellectual and ideational contribution of the EPP group uh, and how these preferences have also been reflected in uh, the policy uh, the policy outcome. So for example, if we look at agricultural policy, we do uh, observe that uh, important and key tenets of the Christian democratic thinking on agricultural policy, like for instance, the, pres the preservation of um, the CAPS, the Common Agricultural Policies, main protectionist feature, uh, also a Christian democratic vision of family farming, um, that these important ideas have largely survived all the different reforms and in large part thanks to, uh, to uh, the EPP group. And we also see, for instance, that the family farm remains a very central uh, uh, discursive frame in contemporary uh, discourses on uh, multifunctional European agriculture. If we now uh, turn to uh, EMU, Economic and Monetary Union, uh, we also see a very important uh, contribution of the EPP group and Christian Democrats, uh, more broadly speaking. It was Christian Democrats who coined the concept of a social market economy. And again, this, social, this concept of a social market economy best encapsulates this idea of a moderate free market economy, which is also balanced uh, with uh, social policy measures. Uh, and again, this is uh, something that is still very much prevalent in today's uh, European uh, Union. Uh, also, we uh, do uh, see that the EPP group's auto liberal ideas for a sound economic, monetary, and fiscal uh, policy and the group's support uh, for a social market uh, economy are broadly reflected 
in uh, the form, but also the institutions uh, that were have been given to EMU in the 1990s, uh, and also uh, are very much influenced the recent reforms uh, and debates surrounding uh, the reform of uh, EMU governance uh, in the wake of the economic and the financial crisis uh, in the uh, late 2000s. Also uh, consistent with Christian democratic values is the emphasis on an effort uh, towards strengthening uh, the social dimension of uh, financial uh, and budgetary uh, governance. The same holds true also for the EPP group's commitment to a qualified social interventionism that was designed to combat uh, social injustice and promote social solidarity sorry, within the EU as a, a necessary corollary to a functioning free market economy. And again, this is something that chimes uh, uh, particularly well with the Christian uh, democratic tenets of solidarity and social uh, justice. And very briefly, another ideational legacy can also be found, and that's perhaps a bit more uh, surprising, uh, uh, in the idea of an environmentally friendly market economy. That was also something that the group uh, promoted uh, quite, uh, quite actively. And I think one of the best examples of this support uh, can be found in the concept of a sustainable uh, development, which the EPP group was actually the first, uh, the first group to use. And, all, and, and again, this concept attempted to bring together, not unlike uh, the concept of a social market economy, which tried to reconcile economics and social justice, but in the concept of su sustainable development, we have this attempt to bring together economics and, and ecology. So I think in what the chapter does uh, uh, based on the analysis of these four policy is to exemplify how and to what extent uh, the EPP group was able to apply uh, Christian principle values and, and beliefs uh, to the formulation of public policy and very important ones uh, in the European Parliament to also steer legislative debates uh, and ultimately influence policy outcomes uh, uh, that would also be in line with these uh, principles and, and beliefs. Thank you very much, uh, Karine. Your chapter uh, obviously stresses the role of transnational networks uh, in bringing out these uh, values and cooperation and we have spoken a lot about cooperation which is an essential part of of politics another one is competition and we have already addressed this uh, this uh, issue and especially after the defeat of the cdu has suffered only a few days ago in the german regional elections there aren't and there aren't many countries in which the christian democrats in power right right now i think competition with other uh, groups is quite important um this leads me to Wojciech's Gag, uh, Gagatek's uh, uh, chapter. Um, Wojciech, your chapter deals with the broad areas of uh, external relations and the strategies and action of the EPP group. How does it stand in relation, in competition with these, uh, these, uh, uh, these other groups? How does it deal strategically and in action with the competition from, from other groups? I would be very grateful if you could be uh, quick in your reply as we need to move to move uh, forward thank you daniela i will try to do my best well sylvia has already mentioned some uh, goals of the chapter i've done and Karl magnus also offered a few ideas about the difficulties of measuring impact and indeed this is becoming even more difficult for my chapter for the area of the eu external relations because it is so dispersed you know you've got areas of rather um, low position of the European Parliament where it cannot really do much as far as the legislation is concerned. And now this including trade where its role is very big. So that altogether creates a big challenge. And I was facing this challenge and uh, one of the biggest challenges, obviously, this is the challenge for the whole literature, not only for my chapter, was to disentangle the impact of the European Parliament as such as an institution from the impact of individual political groups in this context of the EPP group. And that wasn't difficult for a number of reasons that I don't have time to talk about today, but these are very familiar to the students of European Parliament. 
mostly relating to some organizational or institutional aspects, for example, lack of stable majorities, a certain atmosphere of, of all pertaining compromise, or something which is also typical here for the aspects relating to the common foreign security policy and other uh, aspects of foreign affairs broadly defined, namely lack of real lawmaking functions. So, you know, it, it's not a typical area like others of internal politics where you pass legislation. In, in particular, it, it lacks any redistributive powers. And importantly, also, this raises a big question how important these issues are for electoral purposes. In fact, how can you think of this from this point of view? Nevertheless, I was uh, quite, um, uh, it was, it was, uh, uh, it was a very good uh, exercise for me to notice that in recent years, the distance between the biggest groups, including DPP and others, is, I think, um, increasing. And this also concerns the issues relating to the external relations. And not only such areas which you would think, yes, this will be a really conflict for left right politics, trade, naturally, we could find out some differences on the left-right basis, but also in other areas which belong to the broadly defined external relations, including common and foreign security policies. So we see these differences across political spectrum. I've made a point in the chapter about some of them relating to Russia, to foreign affairs and so largo, to the importance of human rights in building diplomatic relationship uh, and many others. So from this point of view, the EPP stands out uh, in its long-term impact, in its long-term emphasis on values, on also something which is typical for the EBP, unlike others, on the sort of collective experience of being in a government, most of the, at least not most, but quite many parties that belong to the EPP, domestically also form governments. I think this creates a little bit different um, tendencies, a little bit different strategies than those who do not belong to government coalitions uh, back home. Uh, so from this point of view, there is also another point. I'm limited by time, so I'm trying to make it very quick. Uh, one of the questions that was raised before about the um, results of the integration of Central and Eastern European members. And I think from the point of view of the EPP group, obviously we have a huge and important politically and from the, you know, from the point of view of the importance of, of, of social debates, also the, the example of the Fidesz. And we can discuss about this, but we have to remember that uh, the overall experience of integrating members of the European Parliament from Central and Eastern European was very good. And the case of the EPP shows that this indeed has been one of the biggest achievements. Uh, you, you can just read any book published before the big band enlargement of 2004 to find out that, uh, you know, the, 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 the expectation was that this is going to be a very difficult process for various reasons of political and economic nature. Yet it came about that indeed uh, these uh, parties from certain Eastern European uh, countries integrated quite well. Obviously, this opens a big question, how can you measure this level of integration, whether you take the voting records in the European Parliament as a point of reference, or rather you analyze the positions of the party leadership back home. And indeed, this is a very important and very interesting methodological questions. These members from the Central Eastern you. Europe uh, brought a very important perspective. I'm finishing here. I brought a very important perspective for the EPP because it, they actually brought with, this, with themselves a much greater level of expertise about the Eastern politics, and which is, of course, visible as far as the symbolic politics is concerned. So I'm thinking about the Sakharov Prize nominations, but also as far as other more substantial issues are related, including the external aspects of the energy security. Thank you. Thank you. We close the round table. Many thanks to all the panelists and I hand the floor back to Beatrice Rios. Thank you so much, Mr. Karamani, for this very interesting panel indeed to learn a little bit more about the EPP itself and about its history. I'm going to close uh, going back to the previous panel and going back to Martin Kamp for the last question. After all that we've been hearing today, after what the many challenges, both internal and external, that we have seen the EPP facing uh, in these many years, what is the main challenge that the EPP group is facing in the future of Europe? As I, as I said, get once again courageous and visionary. This continent needs less confusion and more vision. And if you combine that, you get easily a second book.
about the European ambition. With that message, Dean, we say thank you again to our panelists uh, for this insightful discussion and, for my, and to Martin as well. And we'll be back in a few seconds for closing remarks. Don't, don't go away. And after this very insightful discussion, Indina, I would like to give the floor now to Johan Dringer, who has the incredible responsibility of putting an, an end, a wrap to this event. Uh, he is the former director of the EPP Group Presidency. Please, uh, Mr. Dringer, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. Uh, um, I would like to thank everybody who has been um, participating in this long EPP journey into the heart of the core into the heart of the parliament. Um, this book, um, it's clear. Um, the European Parliament has been extensively studied in uh, literature, but uh, more as a monolithic block. This is obvious from all the comments we heard from the beginning, from President de Hoese, uh, through all the speakers. Uh, for the first time, um, a component and major component of the European Parliament, in this case, a political group, the EPP group, has been studied. And it has been studied, in fact, on, in two dimensions. First dimension, it was raised also, um, particularly by Professor Kaiser, but it was also present in the interventions of um, Karine Germont, and Wojciech Gagatek, uh, the internal balance of power, um, big, small, north, south, east, west, young, old. And this was also then summarized in the contribution of Luciano Bardi. The second one, uh, the second dimension of this study of a political uh, group is that it started a research on how one group enters in contact and do business with the other groups in order to create a synergy and to go ahead on several uh, levels, on several areas. Um, I think it's what was mentioned and what we keep, have to keep is this book, this research has been done by academics, but the result, the publication, is not only for academics. It can be read, read as a one book. You start from the introduction and you go to chapter five. Or who is more interested in one aspect, let's say foreign affairs, external relations, you can easily take this out and what is the EPP doing, thinking, about external affairs. And in this sense, I, th I think it's, it's, it's important. It's not a handbook of how parliamentary uh, democracy functions in the EPP and in the, or in the, in the parliament, but it offers when it is functional insight into the tools with which parliamentary democracy takes forms. I'm thinking here on occasional um, references to the internal, internal organization of the group, the importance of his staff, uh, the role of rapporteurs, shadows, coordinators, the importance of, um, importance of functions, role, uh, the institutional relevance index, and even the DON system is, 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 is present and, and uh, uh, explained to who is not familiar with this. So, I mean, Beside the factual conclusions about the success or the failure of uh, uh, the EPP, um, first, for the first time, a framework has been created and tested that Banki used and considered as useful for more research. And the first suggestion which would then come in mind is extend the research to other EPP aspects and other policies and I'm thinking here in the first line in finance-related uh, matters, budget, regional affairs, transport policy. The second suggestion has been made. 
proceed to an analysis of the ambition of the other political groups like uh, the socialist ALDE and so on. Uh, but I think at the moment of uh, which the, the conference of uh, the future is about to start, I, something more could be done. Um, it emerged from uh, this book and from this research that the cooperation, I, don't, I have to be prudent when I say cooperation, I prefer the word synergy, the synergy between the political groups, first two, then three, and then since 2004, uh, 2009, sorry, before group, the fourth group, the this synergy, the score to which uh, Luciano Bardi referred, um, is very complete, is crucial. The, cru the, the core has guaranteed the presence of a strong Europeanist majority in the parliament against Eurosceptic groups. And um, second, the existence of this core was needed and was a must for the EP to grow in importance and formal powers and to raise its political leverage vis-à-vis -vis the other European institutions. So research could concentrate, concentrate on the role of the core in some of the battles which uh, uh, Julian Priestley uh, described it as having shaped the, the European Parliament. The first battle is the fight around the budget, a battle that started already in 79, when the Parliament rejected the budget in its entirety and plunged the institutions in crisis. The second battle is, not all appreciate this uh, terminology, but it was used also during the debate, the parliamentarization of the Union. It started more or less with the fall of the Center Commission and, as it was also mentioned, it is still going on uh, even with the approval of the last Commission of uh, Frau von der Leyen. And the third battle would then be, we could concentrate on, would be the cooperation of core groups in constitutional reforms and how they stick together in order to uh, shape or give more power to the parliament in this. I think this, um, if some of these items could be picked up uh, in a future research and uh, analyzed, I think it, it might help to understand and um, appreciate the ambition, not only of the EPP group, but also of uh, the EP and could maybe contribute to shape the future of Europe. Indeed, because in a way, the history of the EPP group is also the history of the European democracy. Thank you so much to our, our well panelists today for their very insightful contributions and to you for being part of the conversation and joining us today. If you want to keep on talking about this European ambition, you have to make sure that you follow the EPP group in all the social media and the European University Institute, in Instagram, in Twitter, in YouTube and in Facebook as well. Again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you to our panelists. Stay safe and see you soon.